I want to say welcome to this very special worship service for the Gordon College class of 2016. Welcome and thank you especially to family and friends of our graduates, distinguished guests, here to celebrate this significant milestone in the lives of our students. The back, we can clap. <laughs> The baccalaureate is a worship service, a way of deliberately bringing ourselves, our whole being, before God and committing ourselves to trying to honor him through this significant milestone in preparation for tomorrow's commencement exercises for our graduates. It's going to be hard to see you all go. It's been a very significant four years, and you have made a significant impact on our college community. We are not the same having had you here. We're grateful for all that God has done in your life and in your midst. And thank you for blessing our community. I wanna remind you of a story that you may have heard when you came as a prospective student. Our founder, A.J. Gordon, was the pastor of Clarendon Street Baptist Church. He founded Gordon College in 1889. He served as our founding president and was the guiding force of the institution that we now inherit as part of the Gordon College community, the institution that bears his name. He fell ill in January of 1895. Members of his church came to pray by his bedside on what turned out to be his last evening. As the group was there gathered, they said, Dr. Gordon, do you have a word for us tonight? He was suffering from pneumonia and didn't have a lot of breath left in him. In fact, he only was able to say one word. It ended up being his last word. That simple word was victory. For us at Gordon College, victory is not about winning. It's not about completing an academic exercise, or getting a certain grade, or even getting a diploma. Victory is about a life well lived. That's what we hope that you have developed over the last four years. We hope that we've encouraged you along in that important process. That's actually what this worship service is about, rededicating ourselves to the kind of life that honors the Lord, a life worth leading, a life that's in alignment with the gospel a life that reflects the kind of way of Christ, of honoring him and serving others. 1 Thessalonians 2.8 says, we were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well, because you've become so dear to us. Class of 2016, those words are true. You are very dear to us, and we come to celebrate all that God is doing in your life that has brought you to this day and all that he will do in the days ahead. Now, if you'll please rise for the invocation and the opening uh, scripture. Would you please pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of your Son, Jesus, through the power of your Holy Spirit, Thank you for your presence here among us in this place, Lord. You are the source of all that is good, and we thank you for the journey that you have led us on. We thank you for your faithfulness through the trials and for the joy of your salvation. Prepare our hearts now as we come together to praise your name, for you are worthy of all of the honor and all of the glory. This we pray in the precious name of, of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hear this call to worship from 1 Chronicles 29. Praise be to you, O Lord, the God of our Father Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in heaven and on earth is yours. Yours, O Lord, is the kingdom and you are exalted as head above all. 
Wealth and honor come from you. You are the ruler of all things. In your hands are great strength and power to exalt and give strength to all. Now, our God, we give you thanks and praise your glorious name. Would you remain standing for the opening hymn? Please be seated. Welcome. Class of 2016, I'll be the first to tell you this, but definitely not the last. Congratulations. Give a round of applause. Hopefully, 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 you've turned in your last paper and project. If not, we have exits to my left and my right. And behind you, go to Kosh, Jenks, wherever you need to go to get that finished up. To all the families and friends here, we want to say welcome and also thank you. You've been a critical piece 
to the project that is sitting in here today and will be walking across the stage tomorrow. As we all embark on this new stage in our lives, it's important to keep the past relevant. The same person who walks across the stage will not be the same person who entered Gordon four years ago. Being at Gordon was a season of change in my life. Coming from a rough neighborhood and both parents without a college education may come to Gordon all of God's doing. The odds were definitely against me, but the grace of God was definitely with me. Being at Gordon has definitely opened my eyes and heart to what was really going on in the world around me. I was here when the Boston Marathon bombing happened. I was here when the shooting in Newtown occurred. I can still remember the fear and tears from my fellow classmates. It was here that topics surrounding the LGBTQ community were at my front steps every day. It was here where racial tensions could be felt on campus at one point and people started asking themselves and other people you know, important questions about identity. With that, it was here where I saw Ferguson go up in flames when the decision about Michael Brown's shooting was made. All of these different experiences happened during different seasons during my time at Gordon. It opened up numerous conversations. It created and unfortunately ended some relationships. It changed the way I look at the world around me. It changed me, broadened my perspectives on life. However, being at Gordon was my only opportunity to learn and develop my own ideas and opinions. Now that this season is coming to an end, I must get ready to experience more growth. It's inevitable. How we respond to change is crucial. We're entering another season of change and it is important to be aware of the world we are entering. We're getting ready to enter some of the best days of our lives, and for some of us, some of the worst. However, the climax of our lives has yet to come for some of us. But it's important that we be prepared for this next season that we're about to embark on. We all have different passions and different interests. The question asked on your first day of college shouldn't have been what you want to major in, but what problem you want to fix to make a difference in the world. Because that's how I see each individual here as a difference maker in the world. I challenge each and every one of us not to embrace the changes that happens in our lives, but to become an agent of change in the lives of others. We have to become too mu we've become too much of a society that likes to stick to the status quo and go with the flow. However, we must always remember that God did not design life to be that way. He sent his son Jesus Christ to enter humanity and break the status quo. He provided us a new way. He told folks that this is the law you have been taught, but I say otherwise. Even as we can see in society today, you will sometimes make enemies and people will go against you. Isaiah 41.10 says, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with, your, with my righteous right hand. The last four years will not be the telling story of your next four years. God has something in store for each individual in this room right now. And it will definitely impact your growth and your understanding. He's going to deliver. For some of us, we didn't think we'd make it to this day, and God delivered. So with this deliverance, let's go make a difference. No matter where you go, who you meet, how much money you make, no matter what, never forget how much your lives have been impacted or have been impacted over the last four years and for many more to come. People tend to naturally fear change, but we have no reason to fear it. It is change that has allowed us to celebrate this day, and it's change that will allow each and every one of us to fulfill God's will. Thank you, and God bless you. These past few months, I, like many seniors, have spent time reflecting on the topic of change. To be honest, thinking of life shifting fills me with anxiety. What if I fall flat on my face? What if I can't pay my rent? What if I'm just bad at this life thing? These unknowns have led me to realize that life in all stages has a steep learning curve. Today, some of us stand at the edge of a great expanse. We're ready to take steps into this vast world, 
yet we remain hesitant to leave the familiar. On one hand, it's exciting to ponder the freedom we have to venture in many different directions. On the other, it's unsettling to think of the unknown obstacles and challenges we will face. At this awkward intersection, it's important to pause and remember to be incredibly thankful for the lessons imparted to us. In our time here, we have encountered many wise and patient guides. They have held our hands from Old Testament to senior capstones, pushing us to question the world we live in. They have helped us to discover more of who we want to become, growing us into better versions of ourselves. Through it all, we have been challenged to become courageous women and men grounded in Christ. To our teachers and mentors, our families, our friends, thank you for having more belief in our potential than we did. Your love is what sends us off, allowing us to be hopeful for the future. And this hope is essential. For in the wise words of Henry Nouwen, a man or a woman without hope in the future cannot live creatively in the present. The paradox of expectation indeed is that those who believe in tomorrow can better live today that those who expect joy to come out of sadness can discover beginning, the beginnings of a new life in the center of the old, and that those who look forward to the returning Lord can discover him already in their midst. To live with hope in the future allows us to begin to live redemptively today. It gives us eyes to look at our broken world and in that brokenness, see the potential for positive change. Though we may not always possess the cure for the hurt that surrounds us, we have the ability to be present and to care regardless. This willingness to care rather than just cure allows a vision of biblical community to become a reality. As we begin to knit ourselves together in love, a space is formed in which we learn how to better care for each other. By doing so, we catch a glimpse of the coming kingdom. And so, as we stand at the edge of this great expanse, gazing into our open futures, I pray that we would not have anxious or burdened hearts. Rather, I pray that we may go forward with great anticipation viewing this next chapter as a great perhaps. May we remember to be thankful for the lessons imparted to us and be confident that they have prepared us well. May we seek to creatively question the world around us and work to continually spread a vision of Christ's love. Finally, may we look forward to these upcoming changes as an opportunity to discover that God is already in our midst, guiding us. Thank you. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. Noi ui dira. Voi chei drips. No tut ka viv ja bon Justus. You righteous. It is fitting for the upright to praise him. Praise the Lord with the harp. Celebrai o Senhor com harpa. Make music to him on the ten string lyre. Sing to him a new song. Um novo Play skillfully. And shout for joy. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. The Lord loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of his unfailing love. 
The Lord foils the plans of the nations. He thwarts the purposes of the peoples. But the plans of the Lord stand firm forever. The purposes of his heart through all generations. We wait and hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him, our, our hearts, hearts rejoice. rejoice. For we trust in his holy name. May your unfailing love be with us, Lord. Tampli, Seigneur. Toujours fais nous faveur. Toi, mne, fi undurara ta peste noi. Seja sobre nós, Senhor, a tua misericórdia. Chue inja shimul uriege pepusosa. Even as we put our hope in you. Sing joyfully to the Lord, you righteous. Noi uindra. Voi chei drefs. Nutut ka viv ja bon devle. O justus. You righteous. Sing joyfully to the Lord. Please stand and join me for our class affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again and ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please remain standing. This evening's scripture is 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 through 10, reading from the New International Version. As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For in scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you who believe, this stone is precious. But to those who do not believe, this stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone, and a stone that causes people to stumble, and a rock that makes them fall. They stumble because they disobey the message, which is also what they were destined for. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Please be seated. Good evening and congratulations to the class of 2016. Tonight, I am delighted to introduce to you an esteemed author, internationally acclaimed speaker, a defender of evangelicalism and a Christian apologist. Ravi Zacharias is a founder of, and president of Ravi Zacharias International Ministries, which celebrated his 30th anniversary in 2014. Dr. Zacharias has spoken all over the world, has addressed writers of the peace accord in South Africa and military officers at the Lenin Military Academy in the Center for Geopolitical Strategy in Moscow. At the invitation of the President of Nigeria, he addressed delegates at the first annual prayer breakfast for African leaders held in Mozambique. Dr. Zacharias has direct contact with key leaders, senators, congressmen, and women 
and governors who consult him on an ongoing basis. He has addressed the Florida legislature and the governor's prayer breakfast in Texas and Louisiana, and has twice spoken at the annual prayer breakfast at the United Nations in New York. He has had the privilege of addressing the national prayer breakfast in the seats of government in Ottawa, Canada, and London, England, and speaking at the CIA in Washington, D.C. Dr. Zacharias has authored or edited well over 20 books, of which several have been translated into Russian, Chinese, Korean, Thai, and Spanish. He received his Master of Divinity from Trinity International uh, University and has been a visiting scholar at Ridley Hall, Cambridge, and has been honored with the conferring of six uh, doctoral degrees, including one that will be conferred tomorrow at Gordon's commencement. He has made numerous international television appearances, and his weekly radio program airs on, unbelievably, 20,152 outlets worldwide. Dr. Zacharias and his wife, Marky, have three grown children and reside in Atlanta. Please join me in welcoming Ravi Zacharias to the stage for his sermon entitled, Marching to a Different Drummer. Thank you very much. Whoever was writing my bio got carried away. <laughs> I think I heard 20,000 outlets worldwide would be wonderful. It's only 2,000, so I've got 18,000 more to go. But that may be a prophetic word, Dr. Smith. Thank you so much. My real honor to be here. Thank you, Ms. Smith and uh, President Lindsay members of the faculty, administration, staff, and honored students. This is your day. You probably thought you would never get here. The only one who's happier than you is the one who was paying your fees. <laughs> they are delighted. So if you're thinking of studies beyond that, you better be good to them after you get out of here. I know I have three children, and I'm still feeling the pain of those years, of all the pressure. People ask me why I started to write books. So because my student, my children were going to university, I had to find a way to pay for them. So it wasn't too inspiring a reason, but it was a nice blessing when we started to write and see our, our children graduate and do extremely well. I want to start off with a bit of a humorous story for you because I want to leave some heavy thoughts before you. The story is told of an Indian who was flying on a plane and happened to be sitting next to the scientist Einstein. That tells you the imagination is already being stretched. So while he was sitting next to Einstein, Einstein said, you know, we've got a long journey ahead of us. Why don't we have a bit of a game? I will ask you a question, and uh, then if you answer it, I will pay you a certain amount. You ask me a question, and if I answer it, you pay me a certain amount. He said, that's not fair. You're Einstein. So no, no, no. If I answer your question, you pay me $5, and if uh, you answer my question, I will pay you $500. So that's pretty even. I will raise the question for you and uh, you answer it and I will pay you 500 You raise the question for me. If I can't, I'll give you five. You see, this is the way it goes. So I hope I've got that straight. So here the, the guy goes, uh, looks at Einstein. He said, you, you, you start first. So he said to the Indian young man, how far is the moon from the earth? And the Indian said, you know, I don't know the exact number here. So uh, here's $5 for you. Einstein put it in his pocket, then the Indian looked at Einstein and says, what goes up the mountain with three legs and comes down with four legs? And Einstein started to figure this out with all kinds of equations and all kinds of algorithms and possibilities. And then he dipped into his pocket and gave the Indian $500. He said, thank you. He said, it's your turn again, but before you ask me the question, Einstein said, what does go up the mountain with three legs and come down, comes down with four legs? and the Indian paid him $5. <laughs> Have you ever wondered how often we ask ourselves questions in the academy for which we do not have any answers? 
We're able to raise it, and we raise it with greater aplomb and great sophistication, but at the end of the day, we raise a question for which we don't have answers ourselves. I remember some weeks ago, on the night before the presidential prayer breakfast, I was speaking to the media in Washington, and I wondered how to begin with those who probably hear everything there is to hear. So I began with these two quotations. One was from Malcolm Muggeridge, who said this, it is difficult to resist the conclusion that 20th century man has decided to abolish himself. Tired of the struggle to be himself, he's created boredom out of his own affluence, impotence out of his own erotomania, and vulnerability out of his own strength. He himself blows the trumpet that brings the walls of his own cities crashing down, until at last having educated himself into imbecility, having drugged and polluted himself into stupefaction, he keels over a weary, battered old brontosaurus and becomes extinct. I said, Malcolm Muggeridge was a well-known journalist and he'd seen all of the hypocrisies and shenanigans of world leaders and became such a cynic and talked about how mankind would just keel over as a weary, battered old brontosaurus and becomes extinct. But in 1964, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., when he was receiving the Nobel Prize for Peace, said this, I accept this award today with an audacious faith in the future of mankind. I refuse to accept the idea that the isness of man's present nature makes him morally incapable of reaching up for the eternal oughtness that forever confronts him. I refuse to accept that man is mere flotsam and jetsam in a river of life which surrounds him. I refuse to accept the view that mankind is so tragically bound to the starless midnight of racism and war that the bright daybreak of peace and brotherhood can never become a reality. I refuse to accept the cynical notion that nation after nation must spiral down a militaristic stairway into the hell of thermonuclear destruction. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. So my question to the media personalities was this, which of these two prognostications is correct? Muggeridge's statement that we will keel over as a weary battered old brontosaurus and become extinct? Or unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality? And I said to them, if you believe in the optimism of Dr. King, that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality, then I have a question for you. The fundamental assumption in higher education today is naturalism. The naturalistic framework informs everything, a scientific single vision for the world. That is a given in higher education in the secular world today. Naturalism, writ large. I remember one student at Cornell once saying to me, I've listened to you for two nights here talking about the answers of Jesus to the questions of humanity. She says, every waking moment, I live with a naturalistic framework. You're bringing in ideas and thoughts that are totally foreign to my education. So I question the media in this way. Do you believe what Dr. King said? That unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality? If you do, what of the exact sciences gives you the imperatives of unarmed truth and unconditional love? Doesn't. The scientists can tell you what happens in a lab, but the sciences do not tell him why he should tell the truth. That comes from a completely different discipline. We may call it ethics, we may call it metaphysics, whatever. Ultimately, it is the realm of the spiritual. And to you young people, here is the quicksand into which you're walking today. The world of academia always talks of right and left. They almost never talk of up and down that there is an oughtness, an eternal oughtness that forever confronts you. And if we don't learn that early in life, we spiral down, at least internally, into a pathway of destruction. Try talking absolutes today in a relativistic world. 
try talking about the moral law as the imperative. We talk so much about rights, we talk very little about what is right and what is wrong. The definitions are gone, and the reason they are gone is we made the most cardinal blunder at the dawn of creation, when there was only one prohibition, not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because in the day you do, do you're going to die. And the tempter comes along and says, no, 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 don't believe that. The day you do it, you will be as God, knowing good and evil. What that really meant was, play God. You play God. You define good and evil. And when there was only one prohibition, which was violated, today we need thousands of pages just for our health care laws. Because we play God. You get onto a plane and they tell you not to touch, tamper, disable, or destroy a smoke detector by four qualifications. Just say, don't mess with it. This is here for a purpose. <laughs> because you, you see in a court of law, I can say, well, I didn't destroy it. I just tampered with it. I didn't quite touch it. I know I disengaged it. All these words that die the death of a thousand qualifications. So I want to answer a very profound question in the few minutes that I have this evening. What does a person look like who walks in the will of God? What does a person look like who knows there is an up and a down, not just a right and a left? The story of that man is told in the book of Daniel, where these four boys, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, were brought in as captives and the scriptures tell us they were selected because of their intellectual prowess and their striking personalities. And they were brought into this setting to reprogram and retrain them in the language, the literature, and the philosophy of the Babylonians. The language is sort of the road in which you communicate. The literature, the illustrations, which opens up the relevance of what you're saying. And finally, when you get to the philosophy, you get to the arguments that are going to persuade people. The language, the literature, the philosophy, their minds were being reprogrammed to think as the Babylonian monarch wanted them to think. And in chapter 1, we see this. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. He asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. In verse 17, to these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. And then it goes on in verse 20. In every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. My talk to you is entitled, Marching to a Different drummer and don't be afraid to do that when you know there's an up and a down when there's an eternal oughtness that forever confronts us step number one he drew the line of resistance by training his appetite there was nothing wrong to enjoy the food at the king's table but he knew he would be so softened up that he would lose the mission for which he was actually placed there all the comforts he renounced, there was nothing wrong in and of itself for him to delight in this, but he kept his vision sharp and focused why it was that God had positioned him there. You see, if you come to this one deep conclusion in your life that God has a distinct purpose and a calling for you, that he places you where he wishes you to be, he equips you, empowers you and positions you in a place that you alone could have that kind of impact. The day that truth dawns on you, you will see your life as totally in mission and a calling before Almighty God. Draw the line of resistance. And I want to talk to you especially in the area of all of the offerings of the world today where we are so taught to think only sensually we have forgotten how to think spiritually or to think in sacred terms. We have desacralized the essence of life itself. You desacralize life and profanity is unleashed without measure. You see, 
The scriptures tell us we are to worship the Lord our God with all our heart and all our mind and all our soul and all our strength and to love our neighbor as ourself. That vertical and the horizontal imperative are so linked together because of the sacredness of what life is all about. I remember it was some years ago, late at night, I received a telephone call. My worldview changes after 9 p.m. I don't like to do anything important after 9 p.m. I'm an early riser, but I'm an early to bed kind of guy too. Just like to get that good night's sleep and win the day the next morning. So when my phone rings after 9 p.m., it's either the wrong number or somebody is really calling on an urgent matter. And it was. This man said to me, I'm sorry, Rav, to wake you up this late. He said, I'm in trouble. I said, what's happened? He said, I've just come back from doing surgery. And a woman was brought into that emergency room. And he said, I've never seen a body so battered, so broken, with every major bone shattered. When she was brought in by the paramedics, and I looked at her in my years of surgery, I'd never had seen anybody so badly beaten up as she was. And the paramedic said, Doc, there's no point. Just give up. He said, I didn't want to see her depart this world that way. I said, we're going to do surgery. And I scrubbed and urgently went cut the rib cage so that I could get my hand into the chest cavity and hold her heart and give her a direct heart massage. He said, I kept going and going and going and going. It was just blubber. I couldn't bring her back to life. He said, I walked away from there wondering what on earth happened. I had no description of what had happened. And as I was washing up, the nurse came and she said, doctor, you better come and take a look at this. This was her bag. And they emptied it out. It was all full of drug paraphernalia, needles used, and all that kind of stuff. And he knew she was a drug junkie that had been caught in some kind of a messed up ring. But as he was looking at it, he was wiping his hand, and one finger felt a bit tender. And he noticed he'd nicked his finger when he put his hand into the rib cage. He said, I'm calling to tell you I may be in trouble as a young father. He said, I think I've just contacted diseased blood. And I don't know what's happening. They've taken some tests. I said, is it a deep cut? He said, no, it's about a paper thin cut. I said, you're telling me a paper thin cut is going to put you at risk for your entire immune system? He said, it doesn't take anything more than that. I thought to myself and I put my head back on the pillow. You know, I talk to scores of people as I travel, and I ask myself this question. Are there paper-thin cuts to the soul? Do they come early by the choices we make, by the things we see, by the relationships we get into, which carves out a steady bleed? You see, not everything that is fatal is immediate. And especially to young men, I want to challenge you about something. Watch your eyes. Be careful what you see. The Lord Jesus tells us the eye is the lamp of the body. And if the light within you becomes darkness, how great is the darkness indeed. Once upon a time, you had to go to a shop and look beyond the counter and somehow see above uh, the magazines which was the stuff that had all the rotten pictures in it. Today, you don't have to go there. It's on your cell phones. It's on your computers. And what do these purveyors have in mind? They don't have your entertainment in mind. They actually have your possessions in mind. And when they seduce you, they put those paper thin cuts into your soul. And I want to challenge you into understanding this, that when that happens, the depth of destruction is incredible. Your very marriage and your very future is at stake. Some of you may have had the opportunity of hearing my daughter Naomi, who came here a few weeks ago to speak at chapel here. Naomi works in the sex trafficking industry, rescuing young men and women from there. And she's told me whether she walks into the brothels in Amsterdam or Mumbai or South Africa or wherever with a Bible in her purse and goes and talks to these young gals and talks to them about their customers They've all told her one thing, almost every one of their customers started to slide into this through pornography. And it's a billion dollar industry today. And so I'm pleading with you as young men and women, as you walk into the future, 
draw the lines of resistance. Do not put yourself in a place where you might fall. As an itinerant, I've had to put that discipline into practice for nearly half a century now and realize that there are places I cannot go. There are programs I dare not see. There is language I had better not entertain. But if I'm to honor the commitments I've made, I'm going to have to be recognizing of what God wants for this mortal frame that he calls the temple of the living God and wishes to dwell within that. Draw the line of resistance. The second thing is to draw the line of dependence. Where are you going to get your wisdom from? You've got a lot of learning now and much more learning ahead. Where are we going to draw wisdom from? And the longer I am in this journey of speaking, I realize how critical it is to have wisdom. Tomorrow evening, I'm on my way to Seoul, Korea, stopping in at JFK in New York. And I got an urgent call this morning. Please, please, please respond to this letter. And my assistant said, Ravi, I know I try not to bring these to your attention, but I really think you need to do something here. So a man who has written to me saying his brother accidentally ran over his little son last week. Unable to cope with what happened. So I'm flying on the way in here and praying not just for this message, but what wisdom am I going to need? What answers do you give? a person in such pain and so shattered. See, Dr. Jowett once said, if you're speaking to a person with a broken heart, you will never lack for an audience. How critical wisdom is in our time. Oh, we may have theoretical answers. Wisdom. What to say, when to say, what to choose, how to choose, what to do with my life. I've learned much that one of the places I seek for wisdom is I'll always listen to somebody who has endured much suffering and whose faith has remained unshaken. Impulsive reactions are easy for momentary victories, but they are long-term bitter disappointments and long-term defeats. I'll never forget being in Israel some years ago, and I'll give this as a quick illustration, then close. We were five of us under being led by the Archbishop of Canterbury. And we were meeting the leaders of the Israeli and the Palestinian delegations, trying to bring them to the table for peace. We were talking to the religious leaders. And one of them was a hostile guy, muscle-bound, had served 18 years in prison. He was one of the four founders of Hamas. And he was just waxing eloquent, fist clenched, arguing against all that was going on in there. And the archbishop trying to speak to him and to his entourage, just asking question after question after question. With about 15 minutes left to go, he looked at the five of us and said, would each one of you men have one question for him? So we said yes, and I had one. It was a private meeting, so I won't tell you what the question was. But I didn't like his answer. Finally, I looked at him and I said, Sheikh, I really, really don't like your answer. But I want to say to you this, sir, because you and I may never meet each other again. Not far from where you and I are sitting is a mountain. 5,000 years ago, a man by the name of Abraham, whom you respect and I respect, took his son up that mountain and was going to offer him up as a sacrifice at the command of God. Do you remember that story? He said, yes. I said, please, let's not argue which son it was right now. I said, but he took his son up the mountain. He said, right. I said, as the ax is about to come down, God stops that arm. He said, that's right. I said, what did God say? He didn't have the answer. I said, you know what God said? I said, God said, stop. I myself will provide. He said, that's right. I said, shake very close to where you and I are sitting 2,000 years ago. God kept that promise. That time he took his own son up a hill. And this time the ax did not stop. I said, shake until you and I receive the son that God has provided you and I will be offering our own sons and daughters on the battlefields of this world for position and power and land and prestige. I said, that's all I have to say to you. The silence and the archbishop said, I think it's time to go. 
and we walked. He came and put his arm around me, the archbishop did as we were walking down the stairs and he said, Ravi, that was of God. I said, I sure hope so. <laughs> sure hope so. Five of us were walking into another van. The archbishop was the guest of honor. The sheikh followed him to his car. But all of a sudden I heard somebody running behind. It was the sheikh. That belly turned around, he twirled me around. He was a big guy. He could have crunched me with one hug. And he looked at me and he kissed me on both sides of the face, patted me on both sides of the face. He said, Mr. Zacharias, you're a good man. I hope someday I will see you again. Our paths will never cross, but I've always hoped every time he drove past that hill, he will remember what God had done for him so that you and I would not be beheading and slaughtering and killing people all over this world for land and power and position and prestige. You may have one moment in life with somebody for a word of wisdom, lean on God as Daniel did. He drew his line of resistance, drew his line of dependence, and finally, he drew his line of confidence. He never crossed his lines, never did, but three monarchs in a row crossed over to his. Three kings in a row crossed over to his because they saw in him a man in whom God so magnificently dwelt. I ask you this question. 25 years ago, who would have ever thought that the fastest growing church in the world would be in China? Who would have ever thought? Mao Zedong said, it's finished, it's gone, it's over with. He burned the seminary library in Nanjing. It's finished, the Christian message is gone. Today, it's the fastest growing church in the world. America is on a spiral down right now. In three to four decades of traveling, I've never seen such disastrous kinds of thinking that go on. We're lost as a nation. Just take a look at the political scene today. Everywhere we go, the world says, what on earth is happening? The lack of civility, the lack of courtesy, the lack of proper discourse and ideas have consequences. So I say to you, why do I have hope? It's because of young men and women like you. Like the two talks we have just heard this evening. Every campus I go to, University of Kentucky a few weeks ago, 7,000 out on a weeknight. There's no campus but that it is packed to capacity. Doing a university open forum on Wednesday of this week in Seoul. Tickets all gone, sold out, nearly 3,000 students at the university coming. See, they're hungry. You can reach them in a way a public speaker cannot. You are rubbing shoulders with them. May God make you a kind of a man, a woman, who will have such a huge impact that you will never cross those lines, but others will cross over to your way of thinking. March to a different drummer. Draw the line of resistance, draw the line of dependence, and the line of confidence. I believe unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality because that talks about an up and a down, not about a right and a left. Charles Wesley wrote these words, O thou who camest from above, the pure celestial fire to impart, kindle a flame of sacred love on the mean altar of my heart. There let it for thy glory burn with inextinguishable blaze and trembling to its source return in humble prayer and fervent praise. Jesus, confirm my heart's desire to work and speak and think for thee. Still let me guard the holy fire and still stir up thy gifts in me, ready for all thy perfect will. My acts of faith and love repeat till death thy endless mercy seal and make my sacrifice complete. May the words of those hymns become a reality in your life. Thank you for giving me the honor of speaking to you. Thank you, sir, for the invitation. May God bless you.
I'd like to ask the senior class to please stand. I have the privilege of praying for you. Please join me in prayer. Father God, tonight we're here to worship you and celebrate your love and your faithfulness. We're also here to celebrate the hard work and accomplishments of these graduates and the many people who have made this moment possible. We thank you for the families, friends, and countless others who have loved, prayed for, sacrificed, and worked hard to make this moment a reality for these graduates. Thank you for the many teachers, faculty, staff, administration who have challenged, cared for, taught, and encouraged each one of these students along their academic journey. We thank you for the lifelong friendships that have been forged here at Gordon. And we praise you for the learning, the growth, the laughter, the tears, the burden shared and the opportunity to walk this season of life together. Heavenly Father, thank you for each one of these graduating seniors. Thank you for your presence in each of their lives and their willingness to serve you. In that service, may they always know and rely on the love that you have for them. Lord, we mourn the ending of these students' time here at Gordon, but we celebrate the beginning of a new and exciting season in their lives. May they go out from this place prepared and equipped to be the light and aroma of Christ in our world. And we pray that this would happen in the mighty and matchless name of Jesus Christ. And it's in that name that we pray now. Amen. I'd like to invite everyone to stand now as we sing together, Take My Life and Let It Be.
seated. For 31 years, Dr. Roger Green has led our community in the candlelight portion of this service. Tonight marks his final baccalaureate in this special role. As he retires at the end of this academic season, thank you, Dr. Green, for blessing our hearts. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and bless your hearts too. So. <laughs> Thank you for that lovely uh, introduction for this 31st and last time. It's been a real joy, and I, I hope that this uh, experience means something to you. This ceremony was part of the baccalaureate service at Barrington College, and since the merger in 1985, has become part of this service as well. The light is lit and passed among these honored seniors tonight, but if one of the functions of light is to help us see things clearly and unimpeded, I should take a moment to express the meaning of this act. What is being done here this evening is obviously symbolic, but symbolic of what? Surely this light is a sign of the illumination received over the past four years within the glorious tradition of learning within the university, of enlightening the mind to the brilliance of thinking in both the ancient and contemporary world. Surely this light is also a sign of the ethical, moral, and personal struggles and victories in maturing hearts and minds over the past four years. Surely this light is a sign of that dawning of friendships and loves developed and nurtured here. But were this all, were this the only illumination of which I speak this evening, I would be less than honest about our commitment to your sons and daughters, your grandsons and granddaughters, your brothers and sisters, your relatives and friends during this time in their lives. For you may be certain of this, the light which you see here tonight is a sign above all of that light, Jesus Christ, he who called himself the light of the world, and he of whom the gospel proclaims, in him was life, and the life was the light of people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In his confessions, Augustine has a beautiful image about his study of the liberal arts. He envisioned the liberal arts as those things which are brightly illuminated by God. But before he was a Christian, he had his back to the light and his face only toward those thoughts and ideas which are illuminated. He did not realize the source of the light of his learning. Neither, in spite of all his learning, was his own face lit up. After his conversion, he knew the source of the light and was himself incandescent because he not only saw the light reflected in his studies, but he turned his face to that light. Were it not for this light, Jesus Christ, and the grace of God thereby shed abroad in our hearts by faith, we would not be here tonight. It is this that we bear witness to by the lighting of the candle and nothing less. It is this of which what we do here daily is a sign pointing beyond ourselves to him whom we love and whom we serve with all the strength of our minds and hearts. To him who, although often pushed out of the center of our focus by the prevailing culture, must continue to become the focus of our learning within the grand tradition of a Christian liberal arts education. What we learn and study here, we do so with Christ as center. We turn our faces toward Christ with joy. It is with this reminder that I pass the light tonight, praying God's richest grace upon us all as these students pass the light to each other. And we, as one, in wondering beholding, reflect upon this event. Representatives from the various majors will be lighting candles, seniors, Please rise.
Would everyone rise for the benediction? Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every good thing for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Please remain standing.